Hi everyone, my name is Gökçen. I'll talk about the reality check algorithm. If you ever get lost at any point during my presentation, please bear with me because I frequently repeat some of the very important points. <laughs> in this diagram, we see our role in the current early warning system. Seismic stations send data to a decision module through three different algorithms, namely virtual seismologist on site and e-alarms. And then a prediction is made and a message sent to the users. We take that prediction message, we take further incoming data from stations, we can either confirm, cancel, or modify the current message. The ideal case is, of course, the confirming, but we might have to cancel or modify the message depending on the conditions I'll show in subsequent slides. Decision module lies at the heart of everything. In this day and age, I could have used a more temporary image, but I use this because I like it retro. So we have <laughs> our seismic stations sending constant data in real time to the decision module. Incoming data stimulates the system, a prediction is made, and the report of this prediction is sent to each station. And in return, stations say what they think about it. So this is basically a feedback loop integrating seismic stations, decision module, and the outside world into one process. At this point, I have a little bit of preface. There is this work virtual seismologist we use a lot in this process. And in a nutshell, I can say it's a Bayesian inference framework developed at Caltech, and there's a fantastic thesis on it. Uh, you can find it on Caltech's online database, also in Earthquake Engineering Research Laboratory's database. What it does, or what its role in our work is that it gives us envelopes of the time ground motions using magnitude and distance as input. Let's look at an example. Here on the top we see a seismogram, and on the bottom we see the observed and the predicted envelopes. If we want to see further examples, we see the clear distinction between P and the S wave phases as the distance between the epicenter and the station increases in the horizontal axis from left to right. On top of P and the S wave phases, there is a constant noise at the station that is added in a square root of sum of square cents to this envelope. So I told you we don't use or we don't directly work with the seismogram, we use the envelopes of it. Now I'm gonna explain to you how we construct those envelopes. This is a seismogram sample at 80 samples per second. What we do is we take a one second long window, we take the absolute maximum value within that window, we call it our amplitude for the corresponding time in the envelope. We run this through the entire continuous data stream we construct our observed envelope. And for this particular seismogram, it looks like this. If we use the magnitude and the distance of this particular seismogram in virtual seismologist, we would get this predicted envelope shown in red. When we have observed data and predicted data, we can talk about a fit or misfit between them. We calculate the fit between observed and predicted envelopes with something we call a test function. It is basically defined as the deviation between observed and predicted envelopes. We take the logarithm of it, and because of the sum S wave code of misfit, we run it through a recursive Butterworth high pass filter. Let's look at an example. Here is the uh, observed and predicted envelopes from the previous step. And on the bottom or the second row, we see the test function computed for these envelopes. So this shows us a test function, test function is actually a time evolving misfit calculation between the observed and the predicted data. When the virtual seismologist was being built, just like with any other work, they started with an assumption, and the assumption for the regression was that the misfit between observed and the predicted envelopes will be a normal distribution in log space. So let's check that 
assumption. Here is the test function results I showed you earlier. For this particular test function, or in other words, the misfit between observed and the predicted data, there are 150 deviation values. If we plot them in a histogram as amplitude versus number, where each bin indicates the number of <coughs> amplitudes for a certain amplitude range, we can see a normal distribution is adequate for this distribution to explain it. In other words, their assumption is verified. We can make use of this assumption saying that, okay, if there is departure from normality, in other words, if there is too much disagreement between what we observe and what we think we observe, that could be a flag in our work to tell us that, okay, something is wrong, data do not match. It is easy for a human being to detect an outlier in a normal distribution or to detect once a normal distribution deviates from normality. But how do we make a computer to do it robustly and automatically? We use two higher order statistics functions, namely kurtosis and skewness. Kurtosis is defined as the fourth moment about the mean of a distribution normalized using the variance of that distribution. Kurtosis for a normal distribution is three. In our work, we subtract three from every calculation, so we compute excess kurtosis and we call it zero uh, for a normal distribution. Kurtosis indicates tail behavior. Once you have outliers, which will be in the tails, the kurtosis value for that distribution will go way up. Secuness, on the other hand, is the third moment about the mean, again normalized using the variance of that mean. So both of these functions are dimensionless. Skewness represents the symmetry of the distribution. A theoretical normal distribution is perfectly symmetrical and the skewness for it is zero. But depending on the location of the outlier, you can either have positive skewness or negative skewness. The examples will come up. Let's look at one particular example and our algorithm at work. The First row in shows a seismogram. We constructed uh, synthetically. We basically put two events back to back. And the second row, we constructed the envelopes of it. From now on, I'll just show you the envelopes, not the seismograms. So at this point, we know that decision module made a good prediction, but we thought there was only one event. So the predicted envelope is laid over <coughs> the observed one and we compute the <coughs> test function in real time at every second. The, red, the green arrow and the right edge of the green box indicates real time. So we compute our test function as I showed you earlier. At this point, I like to open a parenthesis and tell you about the way we compute our kurtosis and this novel idea of multiple windows. In the first row, we see the test functions results from the previous step. And the second row indicates the kurtosis computation for that test function using its 20 second long window. For instance, if we wanna compute the kurtosis value of the highlighted area, we go to the corresponding value for the test function and we go back as much as the time window length and we compute the histogram of the values within that window. And the kurtosis for that histogram is the real-time kurtosis computation. We do it for the entire test function. Let's look at another example. Let's compute the kurtosis with a 30-second window. We do the same thing. We run it through the entire test function. I'd like to draw your attention to these two peaks in both kurtosis computations. They are window length apart from each other. The first one is clear because there is a huge misfit when the second event hits. But the second one is tricky. By the time you're computing the second kurtosis value, your window involves, your window has the first huge misfit as a value within that histogram. And as far as kurtosis is concerned, the position of the outlier within the window has no difference, makes no difference, that is still an outlier. 
what we do is a pretty novel idea. We stack different window kurtosis computations up. We linearly add them up. And because the first peak occurs at the same location and the second peak occurs at different locations, while the first one is being accumulated, the second one will be suppressed compared to the first one. This is the multiple window approach for both kurtosis and skewness computations. Let's go back to our example. I'm closing the parentheses. So here is the example. We do multiple window computations. The third row is the kurtosis. You'll notice a peak when the second event occurs and the, there is only the noise level of envelope at the station. We compute our kurtosis. We do the same thing with skewness. Again, there is a peak over there at the time of the second event. If we look at the histogram of the test function right before the second event, we can see that this distribution can be explained via a normal distribution. Kurtosis and skewness values indicate a normal distribution where excess kurtosis is zero, skewness is zero. But once the second event happens and we don't predict it, there is an outlier seen in the histogram on the right edge. Because of that outlier, the kurtosis value goes way up. Skewness value indicates positive skewness. In other words, under prediction is associated with positive kurtosis and positive skewness. There is a counterexample where we think there was an event, but actually there is just noise or a, an event with a significantly smaller magnitude. In order to make it clear, again, I created this synthetic seismogram, uh, two event, one event and just a noise. So the first event is predicted pretty accurately. We compute the test function, and there is some noise at a station that could be due to a helicopter landing nearby. I think there is an example on Iris's website where there is an elk roaming around the seismic station. So that, that could trick the system into believing there is an event. So we compute our kurtosis and skewness the same way I showed earlier. We have two peaks, but this time, if we look at the histogram right before the second prediction, even though the histogram shows a normal distribution, by the time we make the prediction and realize actually there is not an event, we see an outlier on the left side of the mean this time. That still indicates a positive kurtosis because as far as kurtosis is concerned, there is an outlier, you will have a huge kurtosis value. It doesn't matter if it's on the left or the right of the mean. But skewness now tells us the nature of the outlier, indicating now you have a negative skewness. Hence, overprediction is associated with positive kurtosis and negative skewness. We can use kurtosis and skewness values directly in the discriminant analysis I'll just show a uh, couple of slides later, but if we look at this, where the first row is kurtosis and the second one is the derivative of it, again, the third row is the skewness and the fourth row is the derivative of it, we went back to the under prediction example, it is clear that the derivatives are a lot smoother in the uh, good agreement times and sharply peaked during the misprediction times whether under prediction or uh, over prediction. So in other words, in the discriminant analysis, I'll just show in a second, we use the derivatives of kurtosis and skewness rather than the raw, derivative, raw kurtosis and skewness. So to sum up, a test function can be under three categories. The first one is the ideal case where the predicted and the observed data are in agreement. Kurtosis is three. Skewness is zero, so uh, there is nothing to worry about, no flags. The other case is where we didn't expect the second event or where we didn't think there was an event, but there was, where the kurtosis value goes way up and the skewness becomes positive. The third case is the case where we thought there was an event or where we thought there was actually a ma certain magnitude, but it turns out it was a really, really, really small magnitude. This is particularly important because it 
reflects the reliability of the system. You don't want to send a message to the user saying that a magnitude 9 event is coming, actually, when there wasn't a magnitude 9 event. Because if people think they have nothing to lose, they might start telling each other how they really feel. <laughs> you wouldn't want that. <laughs> so, in order to prevent that, in this Venn diagram, we use linear discriminant and Bayesian analyses to make these overlapped areas as small as possible. For instance, linear discriminant analysis is a linear summation of the features I talked about earlier, like derivative of vertical uh, velocity kurtosis or derivative of horizontal displacement skewness. It gives us a parameter that parameter maps the current state of the agreement in one of these three states. So if there's only one thing I want you to take home with you after my talk, <coughs> it is this punchline. So our work, reality check algorithm, uses the envelopes of ground motions to check the validity of the messages sent by the system. So on that note, I'm done. I can take some questions now. Questions? Can you, uh, can you uh, know that you are uh, some over prediction or under prediction? So next step, you modify your prediction model. So uh, do you have some idea to how to improve uh, your prediction model? Once we detect there is something wrong, when once we detect there is some error, our next step will be how big that error is. We will use the ground motion prediction equations again provided in virtual seismologists to come up with a magnitude and a location estimate. So once we detect something is wrong, we will uh, modify that message that was sent earlier. So how many seconds do you need to, uh, to tell whether it's a real uh, earthquake or not, you, how many seconds of a wave form? Once the decision module makes a prediction, we work on that prediction. So if there is a misfit of unacceptable limits, we will know within a second. But the one second window I showed earlier for the envelopes was just something to begin with. Eventually, we might decrease that window length to a half a second or quarter of a second to compute the envelopes, and that would, also, of course, increase the warning time. So how much time do you have now? A second. How many minutes left? Okay, so, so how, 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 what, is the length of, what is the length of the envelope uh, you have now achieved to tell whether it's a real activity or not? We can tell if there is a misfit within a second. Yeah, but how long is the data that you use to tell that the misfit is a misfit? How you long must long use a data window. Okay, a second. It's only a one second window with one parameter that. Oh, well, uh, if you're talking about the velocity seismogram I showed, think about there will be other channels too. There will be acceleration, velocity, and displacement, both horizontal and vertical. So at every second, we actually have six channels of data being computed. Okay, thank you.